of uh, the mystery of covenant. I want to share with you this scripture verse to begin with, uh, mainly because I like it, and I want to share it. Uh, reading, uh, it's in Daniel chapter 12. You could certainly start reading in verse 2. You can look at it later. But I want to read verse 3 for you. And uh, it's speaking of, of those who are going to wake to everlasting life. That's really who it's talking about here in context of verse 2. And it says, quote, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Wow. That... That gets my attention. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. In other words, there's, there's going to be a great ministry here. And if we will do things the covenant way, as our Puritan and Pilgrim forefathers did, that's what we're going to do. They turned this nation to righteousness. This nation was governed by righteous principles for hundreds of years, at least 200 years. And uh, it wasn't until after the, federal, the, uh, the uh, Civil War that things started going downhill kind of rapidly. But I want to make this statement concerning our Puritan Pilgrim forefathers, and that is that we need to remember that they were Israelites. Now, why might that be important? Well, I'll tell you. It's important because the Israelite people are the covenant people. The Israelite people are the covenant people. The covenant people live by covenant. They understand covenant. Covenant is at the deepest part of their heart spiritually. They know that if they live by covenant and they, and they, and they declare that covenant and abide in that covenant, they're going to have covenant results. Do we not have, or did we not have, and we, and we still do, really, covenant results from their Mayflower Compact? They were the covenant people again. They were Israelites. And they came with a desire for covenant. And they did. They gave us covenant. A Christian document that was a a document that formed the foundation of our government. And so the sign of covenant is upon them and those that follow in that covenant way. The, co the sign of the covenant is always upon God's covenant people. And we're doing that because we're talking about the mystery of covenant and we're also trying to understand to some greater degree in these messages um, why America was so blessed because of what these people did. Seemingly, Christianity is not powerful. It's kind of been, it's insignificant according to the Antichrist, according to the atheists and the agnostics that are out there, is it not? But why do they spend billions and billions of dollars to um, attack Christianity and to attack Christians to keep Christians from gaining in strength and power? Why do they want Christians to look so bad? I mean, if it's nothing, why waste money on them? Why, 
Why do they pick on Christianity of all the religions out there? Why do they pick on that one the most? Because they fear it the most. It undermines what they want to do to establish world government, a Christless, godless, antichrist government. Everything that is going on in government today, everything that they're celebrating today, all the music, all the rituals, uh, all the ceremonies, all that's going on in government, all the football games, it's really, it's a godless world. You, you cannot find Jesus Christ exalted in the movies. You cannot go there and read about the struggles of Christian people. You can't see a good Christian movie produced by Hollywood today on our Puritan Pilgrim forefathers and the true Christian history of this nation and the sacrifices they had to go through. No, what they would make is a movie about glorifying who? The Indians. The Indians did not establish or make this a good, godly, great nation. Did they? They did not do that. But this small group of people comes over to America and great spiritual things developed out of what they did. And again, we need to understand that because our nation's in trouble today. Something they did should link us spiritually with what today, with what they did back then, and help us to understand our situation today and our true Christian duty and responsibility. The question I have for you, friends, is do you really understand your true Christian duty? And responsibility. I uh, have brought with me uh, this book that I've been reading out of. It is called The Return of the Puritans by uh, Pat Brooks. And I'm going to read from page, starting on page 80. I just... Uh, I kind of shook spiritually after I read this. We'll see what it does for you. It says, quote on page 80, On May 26, 1742, Nathaniel Appleton, the pastor of the First Church in Cambridge, preached an electoral sermon before the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. It was clearly a prophetic word, not only for the revolution to come, but also for the destiny of America. Here are a few brief excerpts. Quote, that's what he said. Do you wonder that in beginning to construct our nation in, in accordance with the Mayflower Compact, or Covenant, the first building of note which the Pil Pilgrim fathers constructed was a Christian church. And he's asking that, he's asking this as a question again. Uh, do you wonder about this beginning? And that the first thing they did was build a, and construct a Christian church. Now I just want to stop here. Not obviously he's not glorifying the building. It's not the building. But it is what that building represents. It represents, in a sense, a government. And that they want to come together and construct a Christian government. And it is, it is going to be laid first by establishing a Christian church. Okay. Going on, he says... There was no other way of beginning for them, and there was no other way of continuing for us. The Christian church must be there in the new territory to help formulate the character of its institutions. Please think about what I'm going to share with you now here and what he's saying. The character of its institutions, he says, and to breathe the soul of Christ into its gathering society and to 
incarnate God and conscience in all its history and in all its progress. That is the way it was in the beginning. That is the way Plymouth Rock was, was taken possession of. It is good to keep near to the Plymouth Rock type of life. Man, I'm just like, I'm reading this, and I'm, these words are just screaming at me. Again, he says, it is good to keep near to the Plymouth Rock type of life. What did he know, what did he value about that that was so profoundly important that perhaps we need to take notice of ourselves? He goes on to say, quote, Take Plymouth Rock out of the Republic, and the Republic will fall into pieces in the very first storm upon the sands of infidelity. Hmm. Now, are we falling apart today? Yes, we are. I will indicate two ways in which the Christian church serves the American Republic. It protects and fosters those institutions which have proved a blessing to the Republic. Secondly, it keeps before the people the true idea with regard to national greatness and national strength. A patriotic Christian, as patriotic Christians, there is only one cry in our souls, and this is, quote, America for Christ, Christ for America. I mean to publish this model. I push it on three grounds for America's sake, for the world's sake, for Christ's sake. Number one, we demand America for Christ, for America's sake. History shows that Christian men and Christian women have always been the loyal men and women of the land, and the men and women who have in inaugurated great and beneficial movements. By the way, who are the most loyal people to America today? Just like he said. This is 1742 he said this. Who are, is it still bear true today that the true Christian people are the most loyal and patriotic to this nation? It does, and it is true. America needs Christ, he says, the rule of Christ, the truth of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the gospel of Christ, and the men of Christ. Number two, we demand America for Christ for the world's sake. America taken for Christ means the nations of the world far and near taken for Christ. America, a Christian nation, means a mighty witness for God among all lands of the earth. My fellow men, our country is a battleground on which the conflicts of the ages are to be fought and decided. It is the valley of decision, filled with multitudes and, and multitudes. Every instinct of our being ought to say, Let that nation be saved, and saved at once, which carries the world's largest hopes and the world's final destinies. In the Christianization of our nation, the Republic has its life at stake, society its order, labor its re reward, home its happiness, and the world its future." End of quote. Wow, what a, quote, world vision. What a Christ-centered worldview, we could say. Amen? So, that's the type of understanding, just a small little taste of the type of understanding that our Puritan pilgrim forefathers had. Do you see that type of vision much today? Do you see it in Christian, in Christian churches today? Again, I say to you, therefore, I suggest to you that what is being passed off in the name of Christianity today in most churches is not true biblical Christianity. It's done in the name of Christianity. How many Christian churches today, I realize there's a number of them that do not, but today there, there is a growing number that embrace the homosexual lifestyle. They embrace homosexual ministers even. We've talked about this before, but how could that possibly be tolerated or allowed in a true Christian church. If we're allowing 
things that God Almighty condemns in the Word of God, clearly condemns. There's many, many scripture verses on it. And we say, no, we're going to call that which is evil good. Are we not bringing God's judgment upon us? And should we not then be able to look about our nation today and see clearly God's judgments in our government, God's judgments in the wars that we are in, God's judgment in our economic situation, God's judgments in our, uh, in our financial situations, in our homes, God's judgment in the corruption of the way our taxes are, grow, are going up and up, God's judgment, our resources being sucked out of our nation, going to all these foreign causes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for one world causes. You look at all these needy issues, and I talked to you about Bono in YouTube, the guy that uh, their uh, hero, the humanist hero, and all these one world causes, and Ben Affleck doing it too, and you know the poor, and we want to use your American tax dollars to support all these causes out here. And there are hours and hours of lectures on this and the wonderful benefits of doing this and having Nancy Pelosi there and all that. And our government, our, 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 uh, a lot of our Democratic congressmen, people, there at these meetings. Yet no mention, no, no not one, of the Word of God, no quoting of the Scriptures, no bringing into the picture a Christ-centered or Christ motivation for what they're doing in any of these things. Again, we are living more and more in a Christless world. Therefore, I would suggest to you, dear Christian friends, be that lone voice crying in the wilderness. Do exalt and, and, and uphold and speak forth the name of Jesus Christ. Do declare His purposes. Do pray in the name of Jesus Christ at, at public events. Bring Christ into the picture more and more and more. And let us declare, as this minister boldly preached, that, that we are going to pursue the kingdom of God. We are going to move for a Christian society. We're going to do it in our history. We're going to do it in our, in, our, in our institutions and all the different structures that are out there. What we need to do is start reclaiming all of these things for the name of Christ. We should not turn over anything. We, we should never turn over hospitals to the Antichrist. Do you know, and I'm sure I mentioned this to you before, that Hollywood at one time was controlled by Christians by Christian funds, by Christian money, but they sold it to the Antichrist, and now the Antichrist have control of it. Did that help or benefit? I'm sure they flashed a lot of money in their faces way back then. But perhaps they even did it for nothing. They probably sold out for nothing. They probably got it in reality for pennies, for practically nothing. And yet, we need to stop and think about what are we doing selling out a portion of who we are, our educational system, uh, the entertainment industry. There can be good entertainment. That should not be sold out or subjected to filthy mouth perverted comedians and Hollywood movies with all of their perversions. It shouldn't be allowed. You should be able to go to the theater today again and see Christ-centered, Christ-focused movies. You would think, according to Hollywood, there's nothing Christian about our foundation at all. There's nothing, we're no, there's no movie we can make about Christianity at all. Why, my goodness, if you just use the Word of God alone, taking out present history, taking out the history but just using the Bible and the Bible stories, why they did what? Ten Commandments. When I was young, they did the movie The Ten Commandments. What a great movie. There was a sellout. They can make great movies of the Bible. They can make great movies of, of all the disciples. 
They could make great movies like Ray Cap did showing the destiny and our for and where our disciples went to England and Europe and the, the Bethany family and settled that that land there in Europe it was settled by Israelites and they could show the history of Israel and how that history continued on to this nation and that our nation was founded by Israelites it could be done and I believe one day it will be done. I believe all these institutions that are out there, including our government or all of its branches, are going to be used for Christ-centered purposes. All right, let's go on now because my point is this. We need to increase in the knowledge of God. Does that make sense to you? So let's turn to Colossians, please, chapter 1. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, we will start reading in verse 9. Quote, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire, think about this now, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His, meaning Christ's will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Wow. Well, if Paul could say this and declare this in the Scriptures, and this is by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and this is what the Holy Spirit is saying to His people, should we not pay attention to it? And should not our desire for Christian people also be that they be filled with the knowledge of His will? Are, are Christian people filled with the knowledge of His will? Do they really know what His will, plan, and purposes are? Do they have a vision and an understanding of the kingdom of God? Very few. Very few. The percentage of people that refer to themselves as Christians have little or no understanding of the kingdom of God. Do you all believe what I just said? I mean, go talk to your average Christian out there sometime. What are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about heaven. They're going to talk about hell. I'm going to get a little political here. How could somebody vote for Obama and call themselves a Christian? <gasps> you're getting political, political now. You're, you're meddling. I, I, yeah, I am. I am. I do not want to hear a minister that will not get political with the Word of God. Do I have basis for saying that, or it's just, oh, I have a preference for the Republican Party. No, I don't. In fact, I'm not a Republican at all. I am truly an independent, if you want to call it that. There's so much that could be said about politics, first of all, when you're getting into it, because, well, people can say, well, don't you realize that it's all rigged? Yeah, I do. And I, I know that it is rigged, at least in part. I also know that during the election that the Democrats used the union, union bosses, union labor, union money to ship in busloads of, of people to vote. And they didn't even check. They just gave them, they gave them voting forms as they got off the but, uh, bus that had... Uh, the Democrat stamp already on there. They were voting Democrat. It was all set up. It was all manipulated. Do you think if the Republicans had done that, I'm not pro-Republican again, but I mean, would they have been called on the carpet for that? Would, would they have been arrested and imprisoned even? Would it have been criminal what they have? Well, what, ha what, the, what the Democrats did was criminal. Having, having the... Um, uh, uh, the Black Panthers at certain voting precincts with their billy clubs in their hands uh, threatening people. They were a threat by having their presence there. Uh, could the Republicans have had the, uh, could, uh, well, yeah, just a, could the Republicans have had KKK with white uniforms, white things on there? What would have happened? 
Oh, no, that's racism. You can't have that. Well, why were the Black Panthers allowed at certain precincts, especially in the Detroit area? Why? Well, anyway, we've got to get back to God knowledge. We've got to seek God knowledge. Now, how are we going to acquire God knowledge if we do not read, absorb, and abide by the truth of God's Word? Right? You have to read. You have to study. When you go to man's schools and man's humanistic institutes, what do they tell you? You have to read. You have to study. Well, hey, it's no different, really, when it comes to the Word of God. We have to read, study, and apply but we have the additional help and the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit to help us gain and acquire God knowledge. We're not alone in acquiring this knowledge. It is a spiritual process. And therefore, we have to apply spiritual um, capabilities and functions such as prayer, such as humbling ourselves before Him such as seeking his, his, his amazing grace, his, the leading of His Holy Spirit, and all that we do to help us that we can be a, a, a Christian people, that what we're doing will be in accordance with His will, not according to our own. We pray that He will mold and shape and conform us into His will. Amen? And, we, and the way that we acquire this again is by, through the foolishness of preaching, by gathering together with the saints, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, the scriptures tell us, by hearing the word of God preached over and over and over. I, some of you may be a little bit surprised by this, but I listen to hundreds of messages every year. I have my uh, CD player in my car, and I will acquire various sermons and messages, and I will listen to them over and over. I try to listen to good ones, obviously. I don't always agree with all the messages I listen to, but just in hearing the Word of God by men of God that I believe are solidly Christian, we may not agree on everything, but I learn more in God's Word. It helps it helps keep God's will, plan, and purposes thriving in, in my life. And it creates uh, uh, spiritual, creative ideas in doing this. It helps draw me closer and keep me in a, a good, healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, what I'm telling you again is we ought to do everything in our power to stay close to Jesus. Okay, let's go ahead here with verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every, every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Wow. What does it say again? Increase in the knowledge of God. Well, then... if if it's saying that we should increase in the knowledge of God, then we, that should be first and foremost at, at our heart. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That if we will do things in a biblical, spiritual way, by doing that we're putting Christ first. Maybe you only know one or two steps that you can understand or think of, that would, in your mind and your understanding, be putting Christ first. Then do them. You don't have to have 10 or 20 things there before you right away, but just have one or two. If you only have one, start with the one and do the one. God will add into your faith that you're applying to that situation to gain God knowledge. I want God knowledge as much as I possibly can to help me deal with life's, life's issues, life's circumstances, life's problems. I don't want to be led by my carnal fears and my carnal mind. 
I don't want to be led by the fears of this world. I want to be, I want to have the fear of the Lord. Which means I'm putting Him first. I'm putting His will, His plan, His purposes first. I've got a problem staring me in the face. I don't know how to deal with it. It scares me to death in the carnal and in the natural. But what do I do? If I don't know what to do, I'm going to get on my hands and knees and pray. Well, do you hear heaven open up when you do that? Does God open up and say, Yes, Dave, you've called me, you summoned me forth. What matter might I do for you? No. That isn't really the way faith works. What you do is you pray, you do so in faith, and that's okay to pray daily, because the scriptures do tell us to pray daily, but you don't do so necessarily in fear, but you do so in acknowledgement that I am a child of God, I am putting my trust and faith in you, Jesus, and I'm making my petition known to you, and I'm going to trust you. But what if the problem continues, Pastor? I am going to continue to trust you. Through it all, I've learned to put my faith in Jesus and learn to trust in God. Do you think that life has gone easy for me and everything that I prayed about? All my prayers have been answered the way that I want them to be? You know better than that because they're not, it's not the way it happens for any of us. But what we've learned to do, hopefully, is to pray, place that situation, that circumstance, or that condition in His hands and rest in Him. And you know what? If there's sin in your life, repent of it and get rid of it. How, how, can, we, how can you expect good results when you're not applying that proper walk. What did we read here? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing and being fruitful in every good work. Well, if you're living in sin, what would be the best advice to you? Quit doing it. For one thing, repent. God's gracious. He'll forgive you. You're not the only sinner on the planet. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the thing is, is that if you want righteous, godly, good results, and you want to turn your life around, then turn it around. All right. And, and also, you're going to need to recognize that you'll have better and better results in life as you learn and you apply God knowledge from what we're increasing, the knowledge of God. Okay, let's go on a few more verses here. Uh, Strengthened with all might according to His gracious power, I mean glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering and joyfulness. Okay, I like this. How many of us have patience? <laughs> well, you know what? I got a feeling that's a lifetime uh, exercise to gain patience. Yeah, we improve from time to time, but it doesn't take long for that to become a problem. And, um, and sometimes we can get very aggravated at life conditions and one another and with God Almighty that because we want patience and we want it now, or we want results and we want it now. You want results and you want it now, but you're not willing to pray, you're not willing to, to trust in the Lord. What, what do you want when you have children? You, tell, you ask your, child, your children to do something, and uh, they don't do it. Well, that requires patience right there, first of all, you know. But... I would rather have a son or a daughter that I ask to do something that even though they may go and fall away for a while, but they'll do like the prodigal son. What did the prodigal son do? 
He went into sin. He got his inheritance. You know, uh, he, uh, whoopee! You know, we can go and just splurge and, and life's all fun and games. Um, maybe for a period of time, it's all fun and games. I'm sure for the prodigal son, it was all fun and games for several months. Half a year. A year. Maybe two, maybe three years. But the reality has a way of setting in. Amen? You cannot get away with, I don't care who you are, rebelling against God, rebelling against the Father. You will not get away with it. Be sure, the scriptures say, your sins will find you out. But I would rather that happen and the son eventually come to his senses, learns that he, he can't do it on his own. I need to repent. I need to turn into the father. And I need to start doing things his will. That's, and I think we're starting to see more and more of that. I think as, as, as we see the results of the Obama administration, the Obama uh, politics, I think we're going to see more and more of a real repentance and a real turning in our nation as the years go on here. I really believe that. I don't know how many. I don't know uh, among who. It's in the Father's hands. Amen? Uh, I know, I do know that a number of people woke up during the first term of the Obama administration. But clearly, you look at the, at the, the way that a lot of people are thinking, the decisions they make it, the choices they're making in life. It's like, God's not important. I don't see God alive and well. Well, with, the, with what's being taught in the churches out there, I can see why they would think that. But also, God Almighty is speaking to them, telling them that the truth is not in them. The truth is not in the majority of these churches. That you're going to have to come... Bow before me. Humble yourself before me. Pray and seek my face. Because you're going to start seeing things unravel at a very rapid rate in your nation. You're going to see all these policies that you liked and you enjoy. And you, oh, I can get an Obama phone. Oh, I can get Obama money. Oh, I can do this. And oh, I can do that. And, and I, I, I don't have to really get a job because Obama and the administration will pay for us. And all the, the rich, we need to take money from the rich and give to the poor. And practicing these principles of communism and socialism and see the results of them, they're going to bring you to your knees. They're going to bring you to pray. And what's going to happen eventually? The power of the Holy Spirit. Believe me, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come to bear on a lot of these people, their lives and their minds, and lead them to... You know, grandma or grandpa used to read the scriptures. I made fun of them. I didn't think much about them. But I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to the Father. I'm going to open up the Word of God and get truth. And, and then we're going to see some real changes. I want to say something to you right now which delighted me, and I heard it from Richard Hoskins. How many of you remember Richard Hoskins? He's written some great books on usury and interest and... and uh, uh, he's a, just a fantastic historian. Well, he called me yesterday, and he wanted to congratulate me and, and Martha and what we're doing on the newsletter and give me, say some things on the law to me that he appreciated that we put out some stuff on it, and he wanted to add to his knowledge to it. But he said, you know, Dave, revival can happen quickly in America. And I thought to myself, really, Richard, this is really interesting that you're saying this to me right now, because my brother said the same thing to me when I was in San Antonio, Texas. He got out the scripture and says, you know, Dave, revival can happen very quickly in America. And I didn't quite fully appreciate or understand what he was saying, or even what Richard Hoskins was saying, but my brother sent me a few old sermons, not that he had done, but he had gotten by other 
men of God many, many years ago. And they had experienced um, revival. Uh, I only got, uh, I only have one available right now, but I got, I heard several when I was down there with him. And I listened to those, and it was amazing that when a, a revival happened, it happened quickly, uh, sometimes minutes. And it would just go from one person to another almost. People would just start singing. People would just start joining hands and praying. People would get on their hands and knees and go down the altar for hours and hours. Uh, sermon, uh, sermons would be preached. Uh, Bible lessons would be given. Uh, it would go on for weeks at a time. And, and people's hearts would be converted. And true Christianity grew. A desire for Christ, a desire to read His Word and live godly lives grew. You would see the fruit of the Spirit grow in a, such a movement as that. And so Rich, uh, pa, I mean, uh, Richard Hoskins and I talked a little bit about that uh, at length uh, yesterday on the phone. And I was just, I thought, what a, what a profound concept to hear. And, and Richard to be a, another witness to that. So I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here uh, saying this as a uh, prophet of God, but maybe prophetically what I'm hearing, if there is going to be a real um, repentance and a real revival, wouldn't you want to be a part of it? Wouldn't you? Heck yes. Absolutely. I don't know what way or what shape or form it's going to come. Of any means. If it's of Christ and it's biblical, I want it. I want to be a part of it. Wouldn't you? So it could be through it all in this Obama situation here, we might see a prodigal son revival. Okay? I'm just laying it on you here. And I hope, you know, it doesn't hurt to pray for it. All right. So uh, verse 11 here. Strengthen with all might according to His uh, glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering and, and joyfulness. Joyfulness will come forth from this. I don't know how many times I've experienced trials and tribulations and going through them, but once I come through them and, and it just hurts, it hurts. And then once I come through it, I see, oh, wow, I see God's will in this. I see... God working in my life, joyfulness comes forth. And I realize, wow, you're there. You were with me all the time. I didn't see it. I didn't understand it. I was grumbling a lot, but I could see your handiwork and what was going on. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The saints in lights were our Puritan pilgrim forefathers. They came with light. They gave us biblical light, did they not? They were the saints in light. Now, yes, this applies to the saints at the time of the apostle uh, Paul and the disciples and the work that they did, most certainly. But we are partakers of the inheritance of what our Puritan pilgrim forefathers did, are we not? It says that, partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Were they not the Puritan saints in light? And are we not partakers of of that great inheritance that they provided for us. Who had delivered us unto, uh, who delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Woo! Do you, do you think of yourself as a kingdom people? God translated our Puritan pilgrim forefathers into the kingdom of his dear son. Long time ago, did he not? translated them. They didn't understand it, but when they were selling a cross, they were selling a cross as a transition into a new dimension. And that was the kingdom of God. And that's what they established at the beginning of our nation. So we need to really take this much more seriously, the foundations that were laid for us in this nation. 
our, our America is, it was established as a Christian nation. And I'll tell you something, I'm not willing to give that Christian foundation up to anybody. And I'm not sure how, when, but the fight is on. As Christian peoples, we need to be more than conquerors for the kingdom of God. We should not be giving up what our forefathers sacrificed. They didn't give up for us. We should not give up for our children or their children. I was reading in a book here just recently, and I read this quote. Actually, two quotes struck my, got my attention. William Penn, from six, he lived from 1644 to 1718. He said this, quote, we are not governed by, If we are not governed by God, then we will be ruled by tyrants. Are we not ruled by tyrants today? So if we are not governed by God, notice it didn't say the Republican Party or the Whigs Party or the Independent Party or the Libertarian Party. It's, it says, if we are not governed, or may I add Ron Paul even? I know a lot of us like Ron Paul, and I like Ron Paul. But again, if we are not governed by God, then we will be ruled by tyrants. You cannot be governed by God and abandon His law. God's law has to be first and foremost in our hearts and our minds, right? So according to that, concerning God's law, I want to read this to you from Joseph's story, a historian. In his 1829 inaugural address as a Dane professor of law at Harvard University, quote, there never has been a period in which common law did not recognize Christianity as lying at its foundation. We, America, were given a Christian foundation, ladies and gentlemen. That's the point. And he said, again, this student of history, he said, there never has been a period in which common law, people talk about common law today, did not recognize Christianity as lying at its foundation. It was the foundation of common law. God's law was common law. It was common among men. They knew it. They understood it. Not man's law. Not, man, not the king's law. Not the pres president's law. Not Congress's law. Not some monarchy of man's laws, but it is the law of God. And if we're not ruled by God, we will be ruled by tyrants and we will be abused. And that's what happened way back when uh, Samuel was begging God, praying to God about the attitude of the people out there, that they wanted to have a monarchy, like the, be like the other nations. And God said, all right, we're going to give them what they wanted because they are rebelling against me, not you, Samuel. They're rebelling against me. We're going to give them what they want. And what are they going to get? Exactly what we've got in the United States of America today. Exactly. So there has to be a repenting, there has to be a changing, there has to be a re-education to truth. You, you cannot, as an example, just go out in a military way with your guns, fight your way out of Babylon, if you even could today, but let's just say for the sake that you could, we would find ourselves right back in the mess if we did not have the Christian education and foundation to solidify that, to, to give the people the true, solid Christian understanding that they haven't had before in hundreds of years, let's put it that way, but we regain that hidden knowledge. 
and we do so with a biblical view, vision, view, and understanding in seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then you'll see major results because we won't be giving up that ground again to the Antichrist. And then light will shine forth to the nations, as the scriptures tell us. I look forward to that day and time when His light will shine forth. And it's got to come forth from His people. That's how it comes forth. May it come forth in us. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this truth from your word, and we just appreciate it, uh, this marvelous God knowledge. May we, may we just uh, be good stewards of that knowledge. Help us to be good stewards, your servant people, serving you in covenant relationship with a covenant vision as our Puritan pilgrim forefathers had. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen.